Well, hello again, Liberty lovers. Happy Thanksgiving, and welcome to another exciting interview on Good Morning Liberty. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your families. And in the spirit of family time and giving thanks, especially for family, I asked our guest, Ryan Rolston, to join us today to talk about some exciting things that um, we have to give thanks for. So Ryan is a national volunteer director at You Are The Power, and he's here to share some great stories of families that have been helped by You Are The Power this last year. And I know I am extremely thankful that these families were able to actually share Thanksgiving together, some of them for the first time in a little while. Um, it, it's just a wonderful thing that uh, You Are The Power has helped um, make happen. So Ryan, happy Thanksgiving and thanks and welcome to the show. Gosh, thank you so much for having me. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Thank you. So we have had Spike on and we've also had Meyer on, but this is your first time joining us on uh, Good Morning Liberty to kind of give us one of these You're the Power updates. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to get into these family stories, you know, but before we do that, why don't you take a few minutes just to introduce yourself to the listeners and uh, kind of go over your two minute Liberty story and how you find yourself uh, involved with You're the Power. Sure. Um, Thanks again for having me. My name is Ryan Ralston. I'm the National Volunteer Director with You Are The Power. So I'm sure your audience knows a little bit about our, our organization, so I don't want to um, be the dead horse there. But we are a liberty-minded organization, a grassroots nonprofit organization, membership. So we just focus our efforts to try to help those individuals, families, or smaller organizations who have been adverse, adversely impacted by government overreach. And so I've been fortunate enough to work with the organization now. This is my second year, maybe a little over two years. And I'm fortunate enough, Spike gives me the opportunity to help manage the entire country with our volunteers and with our regional organizers and state organizers. So it's something that I find a privilege to work for this organization and a privilege to work with Spike. And I'm thankful for that. I, just a little bit, I guess, Josh, about like my day-to-day -day duties. Um, you know, we get requests for, for assistance from all over the country, you know, emails, phone calls, we get tagged in various social media videos and things like that. And so we follow up on each and every one of those. Currently this year, up until Monday of this week, we had roughly 300 requests for service across the entire country. And so we do stay busy. Um, I do my very best to respond to each and every email, text message or phone call that comes in within at least 48 to 72 hours. And so it's just something that as an organization, we pride ourselves on. Even if we cannot offer direct assistance to someone who needs our help, we try our best to be a resource and then turn those individuals over to another organization that would better suit their needs. And so for those 300 people who have reached out to us, that's one of the things that, that we really and truly try our best to make sure that we have that direct correspondence with each and every one of us. Yeah, that that's amazing. And and you know, we've talked in the past. A lot of times, these these families they don't know where to go. You know, when when they're when they're impacted by government, a lot of times in their head, uh, because not everybody is so liberty minded like like we are. They they when they have a problem, they go to government. So if yeah. government's the problem, that makes things much more difficult, and they just don't know where to turn. So. I imagine that that when they send out those emails to you and to hear somebody back within 48 to 72 hours that actually has um, some kind of a, a plan or a solution for them, that's just that's impactful in itself for them. So that's really cool to hear. I appreciate that. And, and it is, Josh. And, and I can tell you just I try my best, if, if at all possible, when they send me a cell phone number to call them directly. Um, I don't mind sending emails, but I think in a situation where a lot of these families find themselves in. It, it is that reassuring voice on the other end of the phone that makes all the difference. So if they leave me a cell phone number, I won't text them. I will just pick up the phone and call them and have that conversation with them directly. Oh, that's really awesome. Uh, well, thanks again for joining me. And, you know, I want to get into the, some of these cases because it's really exciting to hear. And, and just at Thanksgiving time, you know, it's time to give thanks. And, and let's talk about some of these big wins that you guys have had this last year. So one of the the families that you brought up to that you wanted to give us kind of an update, and if if you could just kind of give us an overview of what happened, and then and then how it's been resolved over this last year. So um, let's talk about the Savely family to start off with. What happened to this family, and and how did you and you are the power help them out, and where are they at today? Okay, so um, Mason and Madeline Savely are in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're a young couple. They met when they were. 
18 years old. Uh, Mason was in, in technical school, trade school. He met, he met Maddie and they've really been together ever since. So they had a, they had their first baby, uh, Holston. He was born. Everything looked fine. No issues whatsoever. And then they started noticing that his, his legs were swollen. There's some minor medical complications. They, they took their son to the pediatrician multiple times. Finally, the pediatrician said, Hey, you need to, you need to take your son to a children's health care. I'm sorry, to a children's hospital, um, in around the Chattanooga area. They did. They were met with a child abuse pediatrician. And really that's where their lives were turned upside down. So the child abuse pediatrician leveled allegations of abuse against Mason and for the past year, that was a little over a year ago. So for the past year, Mason's not been allowed to live with Maddie or their son, Holston. It's been, as you can imagine, it's been a very stressful time for the family. They are young, but they have a wonderful extended family and support network. We were actually made aware of their case several months ago, but the family was a little apprehensive about going public and really and truly they were a little apprehensive about our organization, right? They didn't know who we are. They didn't know the work that we do. And so I had a Zoom meeting and some of the other team members, we had a Zoom meeting with the family. And I think probably for the first hour, we didn't even talk, we didn't talk shop. We didn't talk about anything other, you know, that was directly related to their case. We just talked about each other. You know, we, we had that connection as human beings. We had that connection as fathers, as you know, siblings, just as, as people. And that's really and truly what we talked about for about the first hour. And then Mason's dad, his name is Wayne. Um, Wayne and I just kind of talked a little bit about, you know, raising children and the importance of, of family. And from that point, we just developed a relationship. We had subsequent uh, phone calls and email correspondence and we, we vetted their case. And so right off the bat, I, I could tell that this family was someone that we would on the surface want to support. I mean, they were open with me. They were honest with me. Uh, their story was compelling. And then when I looked over the documentation, right over the documentation, they're factually innocent. They didn't abuse their baby. No crime was committed. Their child has an underlying health condition that doctors at the children's hospital in Chattanooga simply misdiagnosed as abuse. And so I was able to call them back and have a conversation with Wayne and, and Mason and, and Maddie. And one of the things Josh said to me is, is one of the most powerful conversations that as an organization we can have with a potential client is, especially on a CPS related case, right? Child Protective Services case, because Child Protective Services got involved and we, you know, would not allow Mason to see his, to see a son or, or really live with his wife. And so one of the, one of the most touching conversations that can be had with a family like that is when number one, we listen to them right? because they, they could have been ignored by other organizations, um, or they could have been shunned by family and friends, right? Because they're, they're accused of harming their own. They're accused of harming their baby. And so that there's a, there's that stigma and there's that sense that they might be shunned. But when I, when I spoke with them. And I let them know that we were going to accept their case. And when I say accept their case from, from start to finish, we are, we are there with them every step of the way. But one of the things that I always tell these parents is your, your fight is now our fight. Your cause is now our cause and your babies are now our babies. We, we are here for you from until you are, until you're reunited with your family. And that is always something that I don't say lightly simply because I want them to know that number one, that's what I mean. It's from a heart when I say your babies are our babies and we're going to treat your families if they were our own. And then number two, I want them to know that every step of the way, a member of the leadership team, you are the power is going to be there for them in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And the Savelys were able to go to court in October and the hearing, it was a two day hearing. I was able to go up and then Jenny Floyd, who is a member of the leadership team, she happens to live in Tennessee. Jenny and I attended the hearing on a Friday. We were there all day. Um, Jenny drove from about two and a half hours away. I drove from about two and a half hours away. We sat, we sat in the courthouse with the family. And at the end of the day, justice prevailed. And what I mean by that is, although the case has not been completely adjudicated yet, based on the testimony that was given, 
from the expert witnesses and based on the testimony that was given from family, the juvenile court judge or the family court judge made the decision to allow Mason to go home to live with his wife and his and his son. And this is the first time in over a year that he's been able to do. That. And so oh, that's that, incredible. That was, yeah, that was a huge victory. I'm, I, I can say this, uh, Josh, just from being there in the courthouse, being there with the family, we all got together after the judge made his ruling. We were outside on the courthouse steps, and I don't believe there was a dry eye from anybody out there. We were all just hugged each other, cried together. And it was just something that to me impacts, it impacts me each and every time because again, these families, they don't really know us. They don't really know me. They welcome me and they welcome you or the power into their lives. And so to be invited to, to number one, to support a family in one of the darkest times that they're going through right then and there. But then at the end of the day to have grandparents and extended family hug you and cry on your shoulder and you cry back as if, you know, you're a member of their family. And that's what I felt like, you know, when, when we are invited into a, a family's lives like that, it's not something that I, I take lightly because it is so important that they understand that we are there for them in each and every uh, step of the way. And this hearing was just step one in getting them reunited. They will be back in court. The savers will be back in court for the judge to make his um, final ruling some point in December, we believe. And the only reason why he didn't rule from the bench in October was he still had 20 plus hours of videotape testimony to go over. And so we're confident that based on the judge allowing Mason to go home, that he will rule in favor of the Sableys and, and reunite them. Oh, that's, that is incredible. Um, you know, to just to think that that this family is going to be together for the first time in over a year for Thanksgiving is is is, um, is just, it warms my heart. And and let's hope that the judge comes back in December and just puts this nightmare behind them so that so that they can have a wonderful Christmas or whatever holiday that they happen to to celebrate, because that that is just I can't imagine going through it, um, but it's incredible that the family had you are the power to to help them through it and get through it and and really you know move them in in this right direction so let's hope that that the final um the final ruling goes as as well and they have as great a christmas as uh as uh they just had a thanksgiving so yeah, thank let's talk about the the next family because i don't think i can add any more to that wonderful story let's talk about the sullivans yeah. um so give it kind of Tell the listeners a little bit about what happened to the Sullivans there and where they stand today. Sure. So Corey and Diana Sullivan, they live in South Georgia. They live on the Florida Georgia line. Um, Corey and Diana, they have what I call just a, just a fairy tale kind of relationship. They met in middle school. They've been together since they were in middle school. Um, they struggled when they got married. They struggled to have to have children. They had all three of their children in in vitro. So they have three miracle babies and their oldest daughter was born and, and Corey and Diana decided that they wanted to give their oldest daughter siblings. They found out they were pregnant with twins and they were just absolutely elated. So they, they had twin, a twin boy and a, and, and a twin girl. Um, they were born in a hospital in Georgia and their, their son, their, their twin son, you know, he, no medical conditions, no issues whatsoever. But their twin daughter was born um, with severe medical issues. Right? So we're just going to say she was medically fragile. She spent the first 42 to 44 days of her life in the NICU and was finally released. And then that was about the time that, or just a couple of weeks after that, that they started noticing that her legs would swell up and there was some discoloration. Again, they took the baby to the pediatrician, pediatrician, wasn't sure what to do and said, Hey, I want you to go to a, a children's hospital in Jacksonville, which was the closest children's hospital at the time. So of course they did loving parents at the yard. They took the daughter to the children's hospital and there they met Dr. Barbara Knox, who's a child abuse pediatrician and accused Corey and Diana of abusing their, their seven pound baby, six pound baby. And that was over 400 days ago. And so oh the state seized all three of their children, their oldest daughter, their, their twin son, and their twin daughter. 
and they were initially put into foster care, but they were separated. So the oldest daughter went to a home by herself and then the twins went to a home by themselves. It's been a struggle. They fought, they, they have fought, um, for the past 400 plus days, they've spent roughly $150,000 of their life savings to try to get their, get their children back. They recently won in juvenile court so that the state was looking to um, not only seize, to continue to seize all three of their children and put all three of their babies up for adoption. The judge ruled in the Sullivan's favor and ordered reunification. Um, Dinah was ordered that she could return home to be with her children. And Corey still has pending criminal charges, so that would preclude him from from being home because of his bond conditions because he was accused of child abuse against his youngest twin daughter. So last week, uh, Corey's attorney, who was just a fantastic champion for justice and liberty in Georgia, his name is Kevin Goff. Kevin went before the Superior Court judge there in the Brunswick Judicial Circuit and argued on behalf of Corey, and the judge saw things uh, Kevin's way, which I assure you, it's going to be difficult not to see things Kevin with Kevin's way. He's that persuasive. And the judge ruled that Corey could spend time with his daughter. Like this is the first time in over 400 days that Corey's been allowed to see, touch, or hold his daughter. And the reason why I say that is is such an important important thing is I'll put this in the context for you and your listeners, Josh. Over the past 400 days, I've spent more time with Corey's daughter than he has. I've held his daughter more than he has. I've been inside his home and with his children, uh, with his youngest daughter, uh, more than he has. And so to, to be able to say that Corey is now one step closer to being home and for the first time in over 400 days, he's allowed to hold his daughter, to touch his daughter, and to just be the father that he deserves to be. I've got pictures of them uh, reunited and together in and on a howdy. And the first time that I looked at those pictures, I cried. Like I just wanted to share them with everybody. I said, you know, guys, you don't know how much that I was just sharing with family and friends. Like you don't know how much were and heartache and heartbreak went into this one picture. Like, and it was a team effort. The, the Sullivan's have some incredible attorneys. One of the things that, that we do with all the families that we support is we do email campaigns. We we support them each and every time they have to go to court. The team members and I drive five hours one way to sit in the courthouse with them, and we're with them every step of the way. Um, we offer you know ability. You know we offer I say financial assistance, but we help raise money for these families because these attorneys' fees are are astronomical. One hundred plus thousand dollars in attorney fees, fifteen thousand dollars for an expert witness. So we do our our best to to provide not only emotional support, but financial support for these families as well. And that was one of the the most recent victories that we've had with a, a, a CPS case in Georgia specifically was was with the Sullivan's. Well, that's that's uh, really good news. Yeah. There's been a lot of cases uh, for you guys down in Georgia. That, that's that been just kind of a, I don't know, a hotbed of, of craziness down there. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's been from what I've been reading anyway, and, and from our updates, but it is so, so good to hear that the, the Sullivan's in, uh, you know, like I, the listeners know, I have two special needs kids, you know, I, and I, I, at times I've worried about, about my son, cause my son gets really loud. He stims, um, off of his voice so he can get really loud, especially in the summer. Right. And, and I've, I've thought in the past, you know, so, uh, he was also a runner. So he has gotten out of, you know, several times and we've had to either catch up with him or the police have had to return him to the house and, you know, we can do all the stuff to lock him in. But I've thought like, what if I got that wrong cop that didn't know that I, that my wife and, and I are loving parents and we're doing everything that we can for our children, you know, and it would only take that one to just make our entire world a nightmare. And it's, it's it, I'm very thankful that that's never happened to me, but that's also why I think that, that these, this, what you guys are doing is is so impactful for me and so and why I, I've wanted to get involved the way I have because just because it never happened to me doesn't mean that this nightmare isn't happening to other families. And I personally, I can't imagine not being able to see my son or my daughter for a few months, let alone over a year. Yeah. Um, so yeah. having knowing that the the Sullivans are able were able to spend time together for the first time, that's that's just incredible. 
Um, does does do they they have a a time like frame for when um, they might be able to get this whole nightmare behind them? So the next step in the evolution is really going to be getting Diana back home. Um, that's going to take her back into juvenile court and Georgia family laws practice in juvenile court. And so even though the judge ordered reunification, this, um, Diana had to complete certain steps along the way, you know, certain classes and you know, certifications and things of that nature, which she's done. She's at, she's done that already. And so now we're just waiting to get her back in court, show the judge that she did complete all the requirements that, that he asked of her. And that'll get her back into the house with, with her children. And that's one step closer for complete reunification. We anticipate at least, um, Maybe as early as December, possibly as late as January, February, Corey will go to trial because he's facing criminal charges. So we're, we're confident that once he, he does go to trial, he's going to be acquitted. There, no crime was committed. Corey did not abuse his children. Um, and it's telling to me that the Superior Court judge, who's going to preside over Corey's criminal trial, allowed him to go back, you know, allows him to, to spend time with his daughter. So things are looking up and I think that's a positive for, for what's to come with us, with a soul. That's awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to keep, uh, following the case, but it's moving in the right direction. And, and, uh, what a, what a, what a great update for, for Corey. Um, let's talk about the Collins family. Yeah, that was a big win. That was a huge win, Josh. Um, that is, the first 100% reunification of what we call the Georgia Six Families. We have six families in Georgia that You Are the Power is sponsoring all of them in the same acts and circumstances. And so the Collins family, Casey and Bailey Collins, they are the first complete reunification of what we call the Georgia Six. Their juvenile case was dismissed and criminal charges were, were dismissed a couple of weeks ago. So their son is back home. There are no issues. There's no pending court cases. There's no pending investigations. There's no threat of going to prison for 50 years. They're completely reunified. Their family has been made whole. And I'm happy to report that, again, this was a team effort. It was just us going public, drawing awareness to us, drawing awareness to what they had going on. They have a fantastic set of attorneys that were working with them as well. And once we knew that the truth was on our side. And once the public saw that, once the district attorney there in, in rural uh, South Georgia or Southwest Georgia saw that, um, we knew that things were going to go in our favor, that the juvenile court case was dismissed several months, months ago. And in the judge's order, um, it was, it was evident that not only did child protective services, but law enforcement made a series of missteps along the way. And, that's where in the judge's ruling, just private conversations that we were able to have with the Collins family that we knew things were probably going to go and go our way. However, there's always that chance when a prosecutor looks at something, you know, sometimes the state likes to dig their heels in and they don't like to admit that they're wrong. But in this case, the, the prosecutor, the, the district attorney made the right decision and dismissed the criminal charges against Casey and Bailey and they're 100% reunified. And so this Thanksgiving, this Christmas, they're going to have together in their home with their baby and with no threat of, of going to prison. That is that is absolutely awesome. You know, this is the second one from Georgia. And and we've talked about this on every episode so far um, that we've had you guys on. Um, so I just got to ask, and I don't want to get too sidetracked on this because yeah. this show is really about these awesome things that have that have happened this year and, and Thanksgiving and everything. But I got to yeah. ask. Is there going to be any accountability to some of this craziness coming out of Georgia? Like, are we seeing any judges that are that are looking at some of these uh, the child protective services or the doctors and saying, "Look, you guys are getting this wrong, and this and, and you're tearing families apart. You've got to you've got to be better." Like, are we seeing anything? So there, behind the scenes, Josh, we work holistically to make sure that not only these families are taken care of, but we try our best to get in contact with people who can make a difference and to ensure these things will not happen again. We have had meetings with the office of the child advocate in Georgia. We've had meetings with their director. His name is Mr. Jerry Bruce. 
Jerry Bruce does a lot of training and education. He's an attorney. He's a former juvenile court judge. He trains juvenile court judges around the state. So we, we understand that it is going to be a slow process, but Mr. Bruce and his team are critical component to that. We've had meetings, the team and I, we've had meetings with a U.S. Senator's office here in Georgia. We had our first meeting with his office in Savannah. Um, and then we have a meeting next week with another member of his office on the judicial side, on the judicial branch side. And so we're trying to make this particular U.S. Senator's office aware of what's going on. He's already aware, but we're just trying to highlight some of the some of the, some of our cases and some of the instances where if child protective services here in Georgia would have adhered to their own policy and procedure, then this would not have happened. If law enforcement was properly trained on how to investigate these types of cases, this would not have happened. If doctors were required to get a second opinion before leveling allegations of non-accidental or trauma or abuse, this would not have happened. We've had meetings with legislators that understand what we're doing and support what we're doing, and they're potentially drafting legislation that would help prevent something like this happening. We've worked with investigative reporters here in Metro Atlanta. One in particular, her name is Rebecca Lindstrom. She did a documentary that highlighted some of these injustices. It's called Health at Harms. And so her documentary was instrumental in raising awareness about what was going on internally with CPS here in Georgia. So there's a lot of things that we do behind the scenes in support of these families. It's not necessarily forward facing. You know, the public doesn't necessarily know that we do these things, but the team and I make sure that we approach this again. I, I use the word holistically a lot, but we just, it's not just one dimensional for us. It's not, let's just get these families reunited. It's let's get these families reunited. Let's make sure that this never happens again. And along the way, the support that the families receive from us. Like, for example, we work with counselors and therapists that offer their services either free of charge for these parents or at a reduced rate. There's attorneys that we work with that offer their services completely pro, like pro bono or at a reduced rate because it might take, let's say, $75,000 for an attorney to take on one of these cases, but we're able to work with some of the attorneys and they offer a reduced rate for their fees. Maybe it's rather than 75,000 is $25,000 or $30,000. There's a list of experts that we have, expert witnesses, medical, medical doctors and professionals that we know are um, tried and true and reliable and, and the science supports what they're saying. So we provide these families with some of those experts and lists of things of that nature. So it's, it's really something that we look at just the totality of everything, but behind the scenes on some of that stuff, Josh, it, what it boils down to is the people that are in power who have the capability to enact effectual change, that's who we work with behind the scenes to make sure they really understand these perspectives. And I think that is what separates our organization from other organizations, truthfully, is that we we look at it as a multifaceted issue, not just a singular issue and try to, you know, get a family reunited. We're trying to enact change that not only impacts the families here in the Southeast that we're supporting, but families across the entire country. So that's just something that we're given the freedom to do and that we're going to continue to do that until we get the door slammed in our face again and again and again, which it does happen, Josh, I assure you. But until someone just absolutely says, no, stop calling me, stop emailing me, stop texting me. I'm never going to talk to you again. We're still going to text, call, email, and knock on their door to try to try to get somebody to listen. Oh, that's, that is incredible. You know, I, I don't want this to sound the, the wrong way, but uh, I'm really hoping and praying that uh, with all of your guys' efforts <laughs> in the future, you're just not going to be needed because yeah. things will get turned around and, and we won't have these kind of cases and, and this just abuse of the law. And, yeah. and, and it is like you said, uh, it, I don't think most of these cases are people trying to, to do the wrong thing. They're people probably trying to do the right thing. They're just, you know, seeing, seeing, um, things where they're not there, they're cutting right. corners, they're, they're, yeah. um, whatever it happens to be. So hopefully uh, with some changes in, in tweaking tweaks to the law and stuff like that, we just, we, th these families won't get caught up in this web, you know, um, right. and, and the families that actually 
that actually need the help um, from child services will be the ones getting them instead of this low hanging fruit that 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 just caught up in 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 kind of the wrong stuff. So yeah, and let's talk about yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Well, I mean, no, I was yeah, I was I was going to bring up the next family, but no, go yeah. ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say one of the things that that I absolutely agree with you on is I I want to advocate myself out of a job, right? I, I, like you said, I I don't want to have to do this. Um, let me back up. That sounds bad. I do want to do this work, but if I don't have to do this type of work because the change that we that we enacted helped resolve this issue, I'm going to sleep good at night and I'll just, I'll go to the unemployment office and, you know, try to find me something else to do. But, um, you know, the sad reality is, Josh, is that parents do abuse their children, right? Like, so these organizations like Child Protective Services serves a purpose. It's just from our perspective, when they get it wrong, they get it really wrong and they fracture factually innocent families. And that's really what we're working to, to prevent. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the Bentham family. Um, this, the, the, you, uh, you had brought this one to us. Let's, let's hear about them and where they're at. Yeah. So Cheyenne Benton, um, she's in Arizona. She's a mother who, um, experienced a pain unlike anything that I could imagine. She, she found her son, uh, dead in their home. Like he, she put him to bed a couple hours later, she went to check on him. He was non-responsive paramedics, EMS, law enforcement showed up. And, and he and he had passed away. Um, he had been sick, you know, leading up to that, like just you know, a couple of couple of weeks prior to that, or three or four weeks prior to that. Just like any other baby, had the sniffles. I mean, just young, um, active child had the sniffles, and um, during the night, his his fever spiked to the point where you know, mom didn't know about it, and he ended up passing. And law enforcement shows up as as they should. Um, you have you have a a dead baby and law enforcement shows up and rather than doing their due diligence and, and properly investigate, it's like they had their mind made up that something nefarious happened from the very beginning. And with any type of investigation, specifically on the law enforcement side, you want fact and not theory to drive what you are doing. And in this instance, law enforcement failed Cheyenne and her family because they had a, they had theory and not fact driving what they were doing. And so they accused Cheyenne of neglect or, you know, her neglect resulted in, in the death of her son, which simply wasn't the case. And so we got involved and we're really working towards getting the law enforcement investigation against Cheyenne and her family shut down and resolved. Because one of the, the critical components of this is that the chief medical examiner for the county in which the baby died ruled ruled the debt that he had died from from he was sick he he just there was no foul play the baby died because he was sick so the chief medical examiner for that county ruled no foul play but yet law enforcement still said that you know Cheyenne had you know done things to hurt the baby a second autopsy was performed at the family's request they paid for it again that second autopsy results mirrored the original chief medical examiner's Right, no, no foul play. Baby was sick. This could not have been prevented. M mother did no wrong, and then law enforcement just kept, kept at it, kept at it. And again, they were that theory versus scenario. And so we got involved to really draw and raise awareness to the inconsistencies in law enforcement's in work, and then just we really wanted to highlight the fact that along the way, and every step of the way, law enforcement there in Arizona failed Cheyenne and her family. They had an inexperienced law enforcement officer who led that investigation who may or may not have had an inappropriate relationship with um with one of Cheyenne's with with one of Cheyenne's ex boyfriends. Like it was kind of feeding information to him about Cheyenne. And there was just all this wild speculation. And it's unfortunate because that law enforcement officer again was probably manipulated when it, you know, when it came to her relationship with some people outside of Cheyenne or who were once involved in Cheyenne's life, but were now not involved in Cheyenne's life. And so that really tainted that law enforcement officer's investigation. Again, they were so, they were so young. The law enforcement officer had only been in like in police work for maybe five years, 
had never done any type of investigation, never done a child death investigation and had some issues, some disciplinary issues um, at other, at another agency had been sued a couple of times for some fourth amendment violations and things like that. Should never have, that law enforcement officer should never have been in that position to begin with. And so we, we highlighted that. And at the end of the day, the law enforcement investigation, the, the chief prosecutor for that, for that county declined to, to prosecute Cheyenne saying, you know, no foul play. Two, two, two autopsies, no foul play. And so that really ended the, the law enforcement investigation into the case. And so that's, that's the work that we did, again, just to try to raise public awareness that, you know, two medical examiners, two autopsies, independent one another, some really faulty police work and an inexperienced detective led to this nightmare for a mother who was trying to grieve the death of her son. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's horrible. And, and I, as you said, I, I can't imagine going through that as, as a parent, but at least she can have um, Thanksgiving now and, and that nightmare is, is now behind her and, and uh, she can have the chance to grieve and, and move on. Um, so it is, it is, it is exciting that, that it is over and it's, it's a, a lot. I, I'm not, I can't say that it's, all because of you are the power, but you are the power stepping in to really help that is, is exciting and helping her move on with, with all that stuff. So very, very, um, it's sad, but very, very cool um, at the same time that she can now grieve and move on. Um, so I, I thank you so much for bringing us these, these uh, exciting stories and these families. I, uh, again, I'm so excited that, that, um, that these families have been able to have a Thanksgiving for the first time, some of them for the first time in, in a year or two. Um, and thank you again for all that you guys do out out there. And and um, I, I have, as I've said before to the listeners, I want to stress: if you know of any cases, if you know of anything, reach out to Ryan. Um, they want to help, and and they want to, um, like like he said, they he wants to work himself out of a job, and the yeah. best way to do that is to get the information to him. So so that is that is absolutely awesome. I have one last question for you. Sure, this is something sure. I ask everybody. Okay. So if you. If you had that magic wand, if you had the ability to, to, you know, wave that magic wand and move us either closer to liberty or open people's eyes to liberty, what's something that you would do? Okay. So that's a great question. And, the atl- and I'm going to give you a, a rather simple answer to that, right? So first of all, is having conversations like this. And second of all, um, if we are to have liberty, right? In our lifetime and have liberty, that includes self-governance. And so w- what I mean by that is, and, and really I think about it like this, I'm the type of person who always returns their shopping cart to the shopping cart corral in the parking lot, or I walk it back into the, I walk it back into the, the grocery store and, and put it back up. So to me, that's a prime example of self-governance. I'm responsible enough for my own person. I'm responsible enough for my own actions and I can take the shopping cart back into the store or put it in the, sh- in, in the car corral in the parking lot. There are those who simply refuse to do that. There are those who drop the shopping cart, leave it in a parking space, leave it on the sidewalk, won't return it into. And so I think I would, I would want to have conversations with those people who refuse to put the shopping cart back into the corral. That's to me, I want to talk about self-governance and the ability to self-govern. I want liberty. I want to be able to have those conversations with the people who aren't returning their shopping carts to the car corral and have intelligent, thoughtful, open conversations about why they can't self-govern. So why do they need somebody to say, I have to, I have to do this. I'm mandated to do that. You know, so I think having a conversation, having these forums like this is a fantastic way to do that. I, I don't, I have not had the courage yet, Josh, to go up to somebody in the park a lot at the Kroger or Publix or something and say, why didn't you just return the shopping cart? You know, but I always think about that when I see, when I'm, when I'm driving away and there's 10 or 15 buggies, shopping carts, you know, just kind of scattered around the parking lot. Like, why can't we self-govern? You know, what is preventing us from returning those shopping carts to the cart corral and just doing it for the sake, because it is the right thing to do. I'm not compelled to do, I just return the shopping cart. I absolutely love it. Um, a couple of things uh, that, that, jog my memory to this so so one i have four principles that that um run run my life i've, I've talked about it with uh with the listeners before um but one of those principles is is that that if we want to live in a kinder more tolerant society 
it yeah. comes, it starts with us sacrificially giving to others. And I think that that is a paramount um, a principle for liberty because, because if you are going to have liberty for yourself, it starts with you making sure the other people have liberty too. And that's a lot of what you're describing there. And, and, and the other thing that jogged my memory on there is, is that the honesty of it is essential, you know, because either you're lying to yourself or you're lying to others when you are cutting those corners or you're expecting somebody else to do those things for you. Um, and, and sometimes I think as, as liberty minded people, we get so stuck in our individuality, which is a good thing, but yeah. we stop to stop thinking about others first and, and putting their rights at, at the same level as our own or, or above our own. And, and really by putting those, those rights and those freedoms and just other people's feelings and, 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 um, their liberty ahead of ours, we're really ensuring our liberty in, at the same time. And so I, I absolutely love the answer and, and I agree with you. My, my wife teases me. She says, I'm honest to a fault because, yeah. because, uh, I, I can't go on without, without, you know, being honest with people. And, uh, right. and I think that, that if you follow that, that, uh, that, those, that thought process all the way to its logical conclusion, then right. you would return that, that cart because it would just feel too dishonest to leave it for somebody else to do. Yeah. So I absolutely love, love that, that answer. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So why don't you remind listeners where they can go to uh, get involved with You Are the Power and, and help these families out? Sure. So you can go to our website, youarethepower.net. And from there, you can become a member. So it's free of charge. You can just join us, you can receive our monthly newsletter, receive updates, members only trading. I'm always say like, take us for a test drive, right? There are paid membership opportunities, but join for free. Take us for a test drive. Let me know what you think about the organization. Let you know what you think about the volunteer program. That's what I do. And then also we're on, we have an app now. So you can download our app on anywhere you would download your apps on, on Apple products or Android products. And then get plugged into us. There's calls for actions. There's way to get involved. And there's ways to get involved with us on those apps. And also... If you, if you have a question about anything that's going on, and or if you want to submit a request for assistance, if you go to our website, youarethepower.net, and then there's a contact us button in the middle of the page, click on that, and then just fill out a basic form. The emails come to me, or they go to Myra, our executive director, depending on how they're filtered through. You can also send an email to the council at youarethepower.net, council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L, at youarethepower.net. Those emails come to me. Even if you just want to find out a little more about the organization, you don't necessarily have a request for assistance, send me an email. I will call you. If you pro pro provide your phone number on there, I will call you back and we'll have these conversations. And so I welcome that. Anybody can reach out to us and, and request our assistance. And if it meets our minimum case acceptance criteria, we're going to help you just the same that we helped all, all these other families across the country. Oh, that is, that is absolutely awesome. And I will make sure that the website is in the show notes, uh, just like I have in the past. And, and, um, hopefully everybody gets in contact with you volunteers gets yeah. these, uh, these families before you guys, so we can help more families. And ultimately, like we said, work you out of a job. That'd be great. That'd be great. I'd appreciate that one. Yeah. So thank you again, Ryan, for joining me today and, and, uh, taking some time this Thanksgiving week. And thank you for all you do for these families. I really, I appreciate it. And, and I know uh, these families appreciate it. And again, it's just awesome that they are able to um, enjoy this holiday because of the, the great work you guys are doing. I appreciate it, Josh. And thank you so much for having me. I'll come back anytime you need me. Awesome. All right. So Liberty lovers, I hope you have all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and hopefully you, you, you know, if you didn't eat too much, you guys go and you get out of that food coma and Jump on the computer and look up You Are the Power. Um, help out and and help those guys. You know, get these cases out there and and get these cases resolved so we can have more exciting um, cases and these families can have great Thanksgiving. Um, and just as a personal note, I want to thank you guys all for for um, in you know inviting me into the Good Morning Liberty family and enjoying these interviews. I'm really enjoying uh, recording them and meeting all these exciting people. So. Thank you very much for, for listening and being great listeners and just welcoming me. So 
go on there and reach out to you are the you are the power get involved and if you do that i promise i'm going to be back next time with another exciting person that you guys all need to know until then remember you own your choices each and every one so make some good ones i hope you all had a great thanksgiving a wonderful night and a good morning liberty <laughs> <laughs>